Hi, everyone. I am LaShawn. While we wait for our guest to join, I am LaShawn, um, content creator, mom. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How good are evening. you? Good I evening. am just fine. How are I you? I'm good. It is Thursday, almost Friday. We are almost there. <laughs> you can say that again. <laughs> I am so excited tonight to be talking to you um, about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it is something that since I have a young um, athlete, I'm very interested in. So I know there are other moms out there in my audience who are also interested in this conversation. Um, before we get started, I just need to say this session was developed by Vindico Medical Education with an educational grant support from Bristol Myers. And more information can be viewed in the link that I put in um, the comments. But anyway, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself so that everyone can know who we're talking with. Sure. I I am Anjali Owens and I run our Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Disease at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a heart failure and transplant cardiologist. Ooh, excellent. I used to work in OR in heart <laughs> transplant, not heart transplant, but just like bypass surgery. So excellent. <laughs> yeah, <it was> excellent. <laughs> All right, so let's get to it. Um, when exactly um, does HCM develop? I mean, how is it usually discovered? So, so it can actually occur at any point in someone's life. It can happen in infancy all the way to late adulthood. Wow. Um, and when it comes on, it makes your heart thick, but you may know it, you may have symptoms, or you may be completely asymptomatic. Um, we do see two times in life where it's more common to be diagnosed, and that would be in um, adolescence or early adulthood, the body's changing a lot during those periods and the heart can be thickened um, during that time. And we also see kind of a second spike in diagnoses in people who are in middle age, so in their 40s and 50s, but it can really occur at any time. And we find it in a number of different ways. The first could be if you develop symptoms, so symptoms of chest discomfort, shortness of breath, or difficulty exercising, sometimes dizziness or lightheadedness, or feeling like your heart is racing. Mm -hmm. You go to a doctor, they do some testing, and they can find HCM that way. Another way that we find it is what we call incidentally. So you're not really looking for it. You're undergoing a different procedure, like say, for example, getting your gallbladder out or getting a colonoscopy, um, and they have you on a heart monitor and they see something abnormal there or they find an abnormal EKG, and then that can lead to the diagnosis of HCM. And finally, we can even see diagnoses occur because a family member has been diagnosed with that condition and then a, another family member comes in for screening to see if their heart's okay, and sometimes we diagnose it that way. Okay, so how common is it when you look at it from that perspective? It seems like there's been so many ways that it's silently lingering out there. Yeah, no, it's very true, and, and it's actually more common than you might think. If we look at worldwide, all comers, men, women, children, adults, people of all races and ethnicities, it occurs in at least one in 500 individuals. Wow. The vast majority of those people are currently undiagnosed, either because they don't have any symptoms um, or because they have symptoms, but nobody has put together what's causing their symptoms. So one in 500 people have the abnormality in the heart, the thickening of the heart muscle, the main pump called the left ventricle, um, that is how we diagnose hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If we look at the DNA, mm -hmm. so your genetics or your DNA building blocks that tells the body how to make each organ system and what that code is, um, then we find changes in the code in the DNA that can be associated with HCM in up to one in 250 individuals. So it's really much more common than you might think. I see. So since it's often inherited, I guess you can say, does gen genetic testing works? And if so, who should, who should consider it? When should family members be like screened if they think someone in their family has it? Great question. So um, we use genetic testing in a number of different ways, but the, the most common way 
is to actually risk stratify family members. So as an example, if someone goes to the cardiologist, they're given a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we usually offer that patient genetic counseling and testing. And that's where we go through that the condition can be passed on from generation to generation and how it's passed on, which is if you have a change in your DNA, that code that tells the body how to make each organ, then that misspelling in the code, if you will, that leads to HCM can be passed on to each child. And there's a 50-50 chance of passing on that change in the DNA to each child. And if a child gets that abnormal change in their DNA, then they're at risk for developing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at any point in their life. And those are the people that we follow really closely with EKGs and echoes to see if they're showing any signs of it. If you don't inherit that DNA change from your parent, 50-50 chance, then we don't think you're at risk to develop HCM in the future and we don't have to watch your heart for the rest of your life. And very importantly, you can't pass it on to your children if you don't get it from your parents so that it doesn't skip a generation. Mm -hmm. So the way we use genetic testing is we test the person in the family who has HCM. That's a really important point. We have to see that your heart is abnormal and diagnose you with HCM. Then we start the genetic testing in you to see if we can find that change in the DNA. And if we can find it, sometimes we're smart enough to find it, sometimes we're not, but if we're able to find it, then we can use that information to test any of your interested blood relatives to Uh see if they inherited that change. And it's the same one DNA change that runs throughout generation Mm -hmm. to generation um, of the family. So that's the way that we use it. And if we're not smart enough to find the DNA change, but we clearly see when we take a family history that there are multiple people in the family that have HCM, we know it's there. We're just not smart enough to find it. Then everyone has to keep getting their hearts checked. And that means the echo, which is the ultrasound of the heart, the EKG, every few years for the rest of their life to see if they're going to develop any signs um, of HCM. And so Mm -hmm. generally speaking, family members need to get their hearts checked if someone in their family is diagnosed with HCM. Wow. Okay. So what can a patient who is diagnosed with HCM, can they play competitive sports? Like, is it safe for them to even exercise in general? Um, And if so, if they can, let's just say someone like like me, I'm running training for a marathon. If if I was diagnosed with HCM, could I still do that? It's a great question. <laughs> this one's a moving target. So if you look back in the literature, the older days, you know, decades ago, we were telling patients who were diagnosed with HCM to stop doing strenuous activity. Mm-hmm. So stop mm-hmm. doing strenuous exercise, and we were restricting kids, for example, um, from playing competitive sports, but that pendulum has now swung back in the other direction. We know that cardiovascular exercise, aerobic activity is good for nearly everyone because it's good for the rest of your body and your heart. So we are telling our patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that it's okay to exercise and we usually give some kind of guardrails around that. We'd like you to do a warm up period, a cool down period, stay nice and well hydrated. Mm -hmm. You might want to avoid exercising in extremes of heat or cold and listen to your body. If your body is telling you, I don't feel well, you're getting chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath that you need to back off and rest. With regard to competitive sports, that really requires the expertise of someone who really knows HCM and is able to do a thorough testing of your heart that usually also entails putting someone on a treadmill and doing an exercise test, an MRI, a heart monitor to make sure there's no abnormal rhythms. And that kind of testing is done in an ongoing basis. And then we use what's called shared decision making, which is a fancy term that means talk to your patient, see what they value, see what they want, make sure they understand the risks if there are risks there. And then together with your cardiologist, you make that decision of whether or not you wanna continue with competitive sports. Um, But there are large studies under uh, being done now to watch athletes and to watch people who are participating in competitive sports and really refine that risk and our understanding of, of what's safe in HCM. Wow. (laughs) 
yet tough. Yeah, but that's good to know. That's good yeah. to know. And there's um, a number of different things that can cause a cardiac arrest. It's not always HCM. Mm -hmm. There's other inherited conditions that can cause a sudden cardiac arrest. There's other things that can happen to you, but it's really important that if that's in your family or or it occurs to someone that they get a very thorough evaluation to try to figure out what the underlying cause is so that we can give you a treatment for it. Um, and there are devices that are available called defibrillators. Right. And if you seem to be at high risk for having a sudden death or a sudden cardiac event, then we can implant that device. It's a surgically implanted device. It stays with you for the rest of your life, but it's there in case you go into a life-threatening abnormal heart rhythm um, it can shock your heart back into a normal rhythm. So there are ways to prevent sudden death, which of course is the most feared complication. Right. Um, fortunately in HCM, it's relatively rare. Okay. Well, this was an interesting conversation. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. But thank you so much. Thank for you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>